question. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Mohammed, that we have uh, a clear agenda today, uh, and as you can see, we will already started by sharing uh, the registration link uh, in the chatting box, and we uh, all of us already uh, listened to the opening uh, uh, speech from uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Kahtani, and we will have. Uh, a session about 60 minutes uh, about the uh, incision management. It will be uh, presented by uh, Professor Mahmoud Lubani. And then we will move to uh, cover uh, the other part related to surgical site infection. Looks like challenges and complication. Not sure what happened. So fair. You can see my screen now, right? Okay. Uh, we will cover then uh, SSI challenge and complication, uh, the guidelines and the best practice related to uh, how we can reduce uh, the uh, complications of surgical site infection during the surgery. And then we will have a part related to uh, some solutions uh, from Solventum company, uh, which is called Surgical Solution, that might support you in uh, increasing the patient uh, outcomes and reduce the risk of surgical site infection. So, uh, just to go uh, ahead and to be uh, forsaking of time and to be 100% stick to the agenda, uh, now we will give the control uh, and the speech to uh, Professor Mahmoud Lubani, who will take us through uh, 60 minute, around 60 minute session about incision management, including a question and answer. So, this is how it will go. Uh, Professor Lubani will start by the uh, clinical uh, side, and after he finish, we will. Uh, if you have any questions, please you can drop it easily on the chatting box. And after he will finish, we will start uh, uh, move all the questions in the chatting box to Professor Lubani. Uh, Professor Lubani, uh, Professor Mahmoud Lubani, he is a consultant cardiothoracic surgery and uh, honorary professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Hall University Teaching Hospitals. Uh, NHS Trust and Castle Hill Hospital. He is uh, as well. Uh, Co-chair of Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery Research Subcommittee. Uh, so please, uh, Professor Lubani, stage is yours, and uh, now we will give the control to uh, Professor uh, Mahmoud Lubani. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, shukran. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, Prof. Mahmoud. It's excellent, clear. excellent. Thank you very much. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself uh, a minute ago. So I'll just share my slides and we'll get going. Okay. Can you see my slides now? Uh, yes, clear, Doctor. But if you can put it full screen from top down. Okay, so uh, if you can hear me, I can get started so we don't waste any more time. Um, please let me know if you can't hear me or can you? Yeah. Yes, yes, it's clear. Excellent. Okay, so uh, uh, as I've been introduced, I'm a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon uh, practicing in the UK. And in cardiothoracic surgery, we have adult cardiac surgery, general thoracic surgery, 
congenital cardiac surgery and transplantation. And as a cardiac surgeon, 60% of our work is involved in coronary artery bypass surgery, 23% uh, or so in aortic valve surgery, and the remainder is in mitral valve surgery and aortic surgery. But as a thoracic surgeon, the majority of the work, 70% uh, of the work, uh, is dealing with lung cancer. And patients with lung cancer pose a particular question, uh, a particular problem, because they're already uh, suffering the effects of cancer, uh, sarcopenia, and um, potentially malnutrition and weakness, and that will predispose them already to uh, problems with wound healing. We also deal with uh, benign pleural disease, malignant disease, and mediastinal disease. There's a number of incisions that we utilize in cardiothoracic surgery. The commonest is a median sternotomy wound, where we go through the middle of the sternum to access the heart. Assalamu alaikum. Why is it doctor? Yeah. Doctor, just let's do a slide show. Tahat, to make it clear. Ah, I thought. Yeah. How does this look? Tamam. Take a look, doctor. Tabar. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so. The common incision, uh, as I was saying, uh, is a median stenotomy wound. That is the, the biggest, the most common incision that we utilize in cardiothoracic surgery. Obviously, we do uh, thoracotomies as well for accessing the lung and some cardiac conditions as well. And the biggest incision that we usually do is a thoracolaparotomy for thoracoabdominal uh, aortic surgery. We have been moving uh, recently from maximum incisions to minimal access surgery. And, and this has the potential of reducing wound complications, but it doesn't take it away. And there are many, many situations where you have to end up using uh, a big incision rather than small incision. So we have replaced the big thoracotomy incision with, with a VAT incision where you can create three small incisions to do a lobectomy. Uh, and, and this has been adopted quite widely. It's about in 60 to 70% in most places in the UK. Similarly, in cardiac surgery, we're trying to move away from median sternotomy incisions to incisions like right anterior thoracotomy. However, median sternotomy, as I say, remains the main axis for cardiac surgery uh, to the heart. Also, similarly, with we do harvest the saphenous vein, the long saphenous vein or the short saphenous vein for bypass surgery. And we also have uh, tried to move from long incisions down the leg to endoscopic vein harvesting, which is becoming common, but it's not widespread yet. And leg incisions cause uh, more problems in cardiac thoracic surgery than median sternotomy uh, incisions. Robotic surgery is still is a further step on uh, from video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery where we can reduce the incisions, hopefully with uh, improved exposure, but it is still costly, um, costing about 25% more uh, per procedure than if you do uh, a VATS procedure. So understanding that median sternotomy is the commonest incision and incision and infections in the median sternotomy are uh, the, the, the most uh, catastrophic kind of incisions, we need to understand uh, the anatomy of the sternum and the blood supply of the sternum. And it is supplied, as we all know, by the two internal mammary arteries, which are plastered to the back of the chest wall. They start from the first part of the subclavian artery, go down, and at the end divide into the two branches, the superior epigastric artery and the musculophrenic artery. And as you can see from this angiogram, all the branches of the mammary arteries going to the sternum to supply blood to the sternum. And this is why... Sorry, Prof. Mahmoud, for interrupting, but uh, I think the slide is not moving, not changed. Where are we now? Are we on the internal memory artery? Yeah, I think from the left, you can change the, the slide. Yes, from here. Did yeah. You see, did you see this slide? Yeah, please move from like this one. If you move from one slide to other. 
yeah okay from the list thank you so much okay uh right uh, okay so uh and the and that is the basis for the problem that we face when we use the internal memory arteries uh with the sternum because once you devascularize the sternum uh, you are uh, at the risk of causing problems with sternal wound healing. Now, infections uh, have been uh, classified uh, since 1997, and it is very good to actually have this in mind when you are looking or inspecting an infection or trying to classify infections so that we are all talking the same language. So superficial is type 1A, um, uh, but only skin and subcutaneous tissue um, 1B is when the uh, suture deep fascia becomes exposed. 2A is a deeper inf infection. Uh, there is bony exposure, sternum with stable and uh, steel sutures becoming exposed. Uh, 2B is bony exposure, sternum with instability of the, uh, the uh, wires being used for the sternum. 3A is deep. Uh, and it's that's def three is deep and is divided into A and B, uh, depending on if it's just necrotic bone exposure or fractured or unstable sternum with an exposed heart, or type uh, 3B, where the whole uh, sternum is broken down and you have uh, septicemia accompanying that. Now, we, uh, about 14 years ago, wanted to, we had a problem with sternal wound infection, and we wanted to look at uh, our data. Uh, and we collect, we do collect prospective data, uh, and we have been doing so for more than 25 years in the UK. Um, so we, we have the data for 7,602 patients over 10 years. And we looked at the incidence of deep sternal wound infection. We identified 44 patients with uh, deep sternal wound infections. Uh, and their mortality was higher, 9.1% mortality, than the patients who did not have a deep sternal wound infection of 2.6. So it, it does have a significant uh, impact on patient survival. And when we looked, we wanted to basically validate the STS uh, risk scoring system for median stenotomy wound infection. But we found that it did not fit with our patients in the UK and it might not fit with patients in Saudi Arabia or other countries in the world. So we did a, a univariate analysis, uh, identified uh, the number of uh, risk factors in our patients that led to deep sternal wound infection and with the final model that we were able to develop, just in case if the slides are not moving, the final uh, uh, model that we were able to uh, get was it uh, this here, which included four risk factors for patients that put them at a higher risk of have, developing deep sternal wound infection. One is age, two is high body mass index, uh, three diabetes, and four chronic lung disease. And I'm laboring this point because it's a very important point that led us to all the work that we subsequently uh, have been able to do. Uh, I just want to mention a case report which happened around the same around that time, just to illustrate the severity of these wound infections and how they could kill patients. So I had a 69-year-old man who had coronary artery disease. He was obese. Uh, I did three graphs in November 2012, and I still remember the case. We do remember these cases because they are very traumatic. Postoperatively, he had a sternal wound dehiscence and developed mediastinitis. He was taken to theater to, to, to debride the wound, and the loose wires were removed. Unfortunately, that evening, he had a cuff and started bleeding through the median stenotomy wound. Uh, 
managed to take him to theater, went to an emergency bypass, but unfortunately he had bled out and exsanguinated as a result of that bleeding. So these infections are not innocuous. They do cause problems. They do cause mortality. And that's why uh, we need to be careful with them. So at the time we started looking for solutions and uh, the uh, solutions that we can, we found where we need to basically optimize our patients and patient selection and uh, make sure that they are in the best possible condition before surgery. Uh, we started looking at our operative techniques. But the other thing I started looking at was adjuncts, adjuncts to help us reduce the incidence of wound infections. And I found these two products, Pico on the left and uh, Pravina on the right. And we, after having a good look at both of them, we decided to go with Pravina for a number of reasons. One is that it actually applied a higher pressure at the wound edges, which brings them together. Uh, and also uh, all the exudate, um, all the exudate that is uh, coming from the wound is actually sucked away into a canister rather than sitting in the dressing on top of the wound here. So, and, and that's what we have gone for and we've been utilizing, and I will explain to you uh, in a few slides our experience with that. In 2019, I was involved in, with this group and we published a, a, a review of the interventions uh, to prevent surgical site infections in the Cochrane database of systemic reviews. And what we wanted to see was what kind of evidence do we have and uh, how, what are the missing points that we do need to look at. And what we found was that uh, there are a number of studies, but the interventions that we need to look at um, were quite widespread and extensive. So preoperatively, you need to look at bathing the patients, decolonization, the nutritional status and how you can optimize that. The way you remove the hairs before surgery, when you remove the hair, what technique do you use uh, has been uh, implicated in increasing uh, the wound infections. Prehabilitating the patients and making sure that they are um, at their best condition before surgery is important. Intraoperatively, whether you use antibiotics, which antibiotics, how many doses you use, um, the uh, ventilation system in theaters, hand washing is obviously very important, the way people glove and how many gloves do you use, and what do you use for skin preparation and for draping. And the excessive use of bone wax or diathermy or other sealants uh, that might have a contri uh, contributory factor towards infections. Also, glucose control is important. Uh, there has been a number of studies that looked at that, and some of them uh, were criticized because uh, people were going too aggressive, uh, aggressively in reducing the blood sugars, and that caused problems. But there's no doubt that raised HbA1c is associated with increased wound infections. Wound irrigations are, uh, and the way we uh, deal with the wounds and what kind of irrigation do we use? Some people use betadine, antibiotics. Um, and what do we use uh, on top of the uh, skin wound at the end, the dressing that we use? So there's loads of things that we do need to look at and examine. And then we went on and uh, did this study in 2020, uh, where to look at variations in practice across the UK and Republic of Ireland. And we found that there were in, we uh, surveyed 38 centers, 19 of them replied and 139 consultants. Um, these are cardiothoracic consultants. Um, and there was significant substantial variation in the way the wound, the the infections were actually looked for and classified and examined. The reporting of the infections, the utilizations of bread, risk uh, risk prediction tools, um, the use of interventions such as external support devices, gentamicin integrated, impregnated sponges, and so on. So these variations in practice led to obviously 
variations in the results. And you can see that the infection rates in these units vary from 1% to 8%. So the, the most logical thing to think from this is, okay, so we should be learning from each other best practice to reduce uh, these infections rather than each unit having its own uh, protocol, its own methodology for dealing with infections. NICE is uh, the National Institute of Healthcare, uh, Health and Care Excellence in the UK. It uh, primarily is concerned with cost effectiveness rather than uh, whether a, a treatment is effective or not. Uh, and in their guidance uh, published in 2019, um, they identified that SSI and deep sternal infection is a major cause of mortality, accounting for 7.5% if patients uh, get a deep sternal wound infection, and it has significant impact on the patient's quality of life. And very briefly, they mentioned cover the surgical incision with an appropriate dressing, but they did not give real guidance on what to use um, to reduce the risk of infections. So as I said, we in our study 14 years ago, we identified four risk factors for uh, deep sternal interruption. Sorry, but the, the slides again, not moving. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know why, whenever I go into uh, yeah, slideshow, it doesn't so move on. I, okay, I will stick, I'll stick with that. Sorry, sometime from the WebEx itself, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's lagging the, the slides. It's okay, I, I'll stick with this. Okay, uh, so uh, we have been practicing uh, since the, our uh, previous publications in 2014, we have introduced the Prevena dressing and we felt that we shouldn't be using it willy-nilly and on every patient and we have to be selective. So we identified the four risk factors and what we did was any patient who had two or more of these risk factors, the four risk factors that we identified in our patients, got a Brevina dressing. And the, we reported our experience with that uh, uh, about four years ago as a single center uh, study where we uh, basically uh, looked at uh, three years before we introduced the Brevina dressing and three years after we introduced the Brevina dressing. It is a retrospective study. And what we have found was that uh, we, we had a 927 patients in the uh, control group before we introduced the Brevina and 932 patients after we introduced the Brevina. And this is the total group of patients. Uh, and there was, a, a, there were similar group of patients apart from uh, the patients that received the, the second group of patients had a higher uh, logistic Euro score uh, than the patients before that. So probably we were operating on sicker patients. But the important bit here is the high risk patients. So these are patients who had two or more risk factors of the four risk factors that we identified. And uh, so and these risk factors, before we started introducing Brevina, they didn't get anything. They were just standard of care. But we, after we introduced Brevina, they all got a Brevina dressing. And what we have observed is that overall, in the, in the two main groups, there was a reduction overall in uh, surgical wound infection. But in, in the uh, high-risk group of patients, which is, sorry, at the bottom here, which I'm going to try and, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's right at the bottom. Um, there was a reduction in the surgical wound, a significant uh, reduction in the surgical wound infection once we used the Prevena dressing in the um, high-risk patients. Uh, and, and this is just the same graph showing the reduction in the uh, number of patients who ended up with surgical wound infection in the high risk patients um, that once we started using Brevina regularly. Now, 
this is a single center study uh, and it is a retrospective study. Um, However, it did show that there was having at least having of the incidence of uh, median sternotomy wound infections with the use of um, Prevena dressing in high risk patients. So we decided to confirm this in a multi center UK trial. Uh, and therefore, uh, we went ahead and conducted this study, uh, which we were able to uh, publish this year and this is from three different units across the UK uh, uh, Castle Hill in Hull, Oxford and uh, Wolverhampton and what we have looked at was uh, the group of patients that had Praveen addressing versus no Praveen addressing if they were high-risk patients and this is what we were concerned with the high-risk patients so in this study uh, we found that patients, the, uh, there was a significant reduction in standard wound infections between the standard of care, which was 16%, to the patients that had uh, Prevena dressing. And these are high risk patients. And this is in a, in a uh, propensity matched study. Um, so, we initially had 4,000 uh, group, 4,228 patients that were in the control group versus uh, uh, 1,060 patients that had the Prevena dressing. There were there was differences between the two groups. How do you expect? Because they're the group of the patients that would receive the uh, Prevena dressing would be the higher risk patients. So what we did was we propensity matched them and we ended up with 766 in the control group versus 766 in the Ravina dressing uh, uh, group. And as you can see uh, from here, the total number of uh, surgical wound infection was one third in the group that had the Ravina dressing and it's significantly, the superficial infections significantly reduced from uh, 11 to 3, uh, and the deep senile infection reduced from 4 to less than 2. Uh, and, and this showed us that what we observed uh, in a, a single center study was also uh, evident in a multi center study in the UK. So There was the question being asked, okay, you're using Prevena dressing and it's reducing wound infection, but wouldn't every uh, negative pressure dressing do the same thing? Um, and this is what we wanted to know. Does it actually, is it a class effect or is it specific something for Prevena? And that's why I conducted this study here, which was published uh, last year. Uh, and this basically comparing uh, the evidence that we have for PICO versus Prevena. Uh, so when we're looking for uh, the evidence, for, we're looking for papers that uh, looked at wound infection uh, using Prevena, uh, we identified ultimately eight papers. I won't take you through all of the selection process, but we only found eight papers that looked at Prevena. Um, while when we're looking at uh, PICO, we found uh, four papers ultimately that uh, used uh, PICO and were published showing evidence of PICO. So, and we did uh, an analysis of the two studies uh, and these forest blots show uh, the top one is for the Prevena dressing. And as you all uh, understand, uh, if this big diamond doesn't touch the midline, the one, it means that it 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 does favor one treatment or or over the other. And in the uh, analysis of all the studies put together, we found that uh, Provena dressing does reduce infection 
uh, versus the standard of care. However, when we looked at all the studies that had PICO um, or utilized PICO, uh, there was no significant difference between uh, the, the patients that were treated with uh, PICO dressing versus standard of care. But this was for all the patients, every patient. So you may ask, oh, maybe high-risk patients may be different. So we looked at specifically in the studies that identified high-risk patients, and uh, we got exactly similar results for high-risk patients, that Previna dressing favored, uh, a, actually was more beneficial than standard of care in preventing uh, median stenotomy wound infections, while the PICO dressing didn't. Uh, so I uh, just to make sure that you've seen this. Uh, so the this is in the high risk patients. As I say, the Provena dressing was shown to uh, prevent infections versus standard of care, while um, the uh, PICO dressing uh, wasn't. So. From that paper, we concluded that cardiac surgery is associated with high risk of postoperative infection, um, that negative pressure dressing uh, can offer clinician, clinicians a, a, another way of trying to reduce uh, the infection, but that uh, not all uh, negative pressure dressings are equal and they don't all have the same effect. So apart from uh, the beneficial effects for patients and for their, for their survival and for their quality of life, uh, some people need to be convinced with cost effectiveness. And we presented the, our paper on an economic analysis at the recent European Wound uh, Management Association meeting in, in London. And it basically demonstrated that there was a, a thought, uh, we applied a health economics model to the uh, multi-center study that we had published uh, and we were able to identify that uh, there was a, a, a per procedure cost reduction of 1,852 pounds per patient who um, didn't get chest infection versus the patient that got uh, didn't get a wound infection versus the patient that got a wound, in, wound infection and this actually takes into account the cost of the dressings as well. So even if you're taking the cost of the dressing into consideration, which is a factor basically, because these dressings are not for free and they're not cheap. But if you, even if you add the cost of the dressing, you are still making a cost saving uh, when you are reducing the risk of infections in, in cardiac patients. So in conclusion, uh, I would, like to just say that surgical site infections remain a major problem in surgery in general and specifically uh, in my field of cardiothoracic surgery because uh, as we as I've shown you uh, deep sternal wound infections can be fatal and it, it is so disruptive to a patient's quality of life uh, with having a big gaping wound in the middle of the chest. Um, there are large variations in practice in the UK, but I presume this is across the whole world. And there is, I think, uh, impetus on us to try and develop evidence-based uh, protocols and uh, means to reduce wound infections um, that we can all apply, but they have to be evidence-based, and I said, not dependent on uh, surgeons' preferences or what is available. Uh, adjuncts, as I, I have shown you uh, from the studies that we've conducted, uh, can help in dealing with the problem and reducing uh, the, uh, the incidence of median stenotomy wound uh, infection. And, I, and I'm sure it would do the same for other wounds, abdominal wounds, leg wounds, and so on. Uh, this reduction in surgical wound infection or SSI doesn't seem to be a class effect, as I said, in the sense that not all negative pressure dressings are the same. Um, 
we obviously need uh, higher level evidence uh, for all the interventions that we can apply and, and we still don't have that uh, and the group I'm working with uh, in the UK we are looking at every single intervention that uh, we can apply in the process of um, reducing wound infections for our patients. Thank you very much for listening to me uh, uh, and uh, for being given the opportunity to, to speak to you and share our experiences. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mahmoud, for your uh, valuable lecture. Uh, and uh, inshallah, from our colleague, if anyone has any question to Prof. Mahmoud, uh, please provide in the chat, uh, uh, yani in brief, uh, your question. And inshallah, the Prof. Mahmoud will answer. Uh, we have five minutes to uh, discuss this question. Okay, so there's a question about uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, how how long do we keep the dressing on? So I keep it on until the day before discharge. Uh, so if the patient is going home on day seven, usually in the UK the patients go home day six, day seven. So the day before discharge, planned discharge, we take the dressing down, we inspect the wound, and if all is well, they go home the following day. So you can keep it on for a week. I, easily and I do try to keep it on for as long as I can. So just take it off the day before they're going home. Uh, I can't see any other questions, but uh, Can you show us the photo of blood supply again? Do you want me to, show, to do that? So the blood supply for the sternum, as we said, coming from both internal memory arteries. And uh, if you saw the picture, the uh, I'll try to get the picture up again if I can. Um, but, I, I, and that is the problem with uh, taking bilateral memories, as we all know. Um, if you if you remove both memory arteries, then you are uh, at a risk of reducing of increasing uh, the wound infections uh, and sternal dehiscence. Um, this is the picture uh, that I uh, was showing. The, the, can you see that picture? Is it being shared? Yeah, is it being shared? I don't know. Yes, sir, yes. Yeah, yeah. So as you can see, all the, the these are the branch, and and this is where I, I have had discussions with people who say, oh, let's take a, a skeletonized memory. Uh, it may reduce the risk of infection. I don't see how that will reduce the risk of um, sternal dehiscence or sternal infection because you're taking down the memory artery, uh, and these branches are all gone. So regardless if you take it as skeletonized or non-skeletonized, non you are losing the blood supply on one side and you're becoming dependent on the other side. And then if you have all the risk factors of diabetes, COPD, obesity, all patients, which are the four main risk factors that we identified, on top of losing blood supply to uh, part of the sternum, then you are at risk of uh, external dehiscence and basically, uh, wound infection that is costly and can be detrimental to patient's life as I showed you from the case that I had which I still remember very clearly um, uh, and these cases are very traumatic as I said uh, and dramatic for both patients and ourselves so we should need to we, we should do as much as we can to reduce that uh, Do you advise to include type of dressing to bundle of SSI? Absolutely. I think this is what we're working on in our uh, uh, group is that we are looking at each intervention and uh, negative pressure dressing, I, I think, is one of the elements that we should definitely look at in a randomized controlled uh, fashion. 
and, and I think it will come out as a, a, an addition to our arm in term of reducing wound infection, and I think it should be included. I think we have enough evidence now to include it as part of any bundle to reduce a surgical site infection. But, uh, I, I, you know, some people always need RCTs to be convinced, but, and, and this is what we will be working uh, on in the future. But I definitely do think that it should be included. Uh, how we can choose patients for prevent addressing. Uh, so, as I suggested earlier, we identified our four risk factors. You can look at your own patients and identify your own risk factors. But I think these four risk factors that we identified are quite um, common and quite known to uh, increase the risk of infections. And they, for us in cardiothoracic surgery, they were advanced age above 70, BMI above 32, um, diabetic patients and patients with COPD. So I think if your patient has two or more of these risk factors, it, it's more than justifiable to uh, pull out all the stops and uh, use everything and anything you can to reduce uh, the risk of uh, median sternotomy infection and dehiscence because that is a major, major disaster. Um, yeah, that's the same. What are the key patients related to procedure related? Yeah, uh, patients related or procedure related risk factors considered. Uh, I'm not sure if the, this question uh, looking at what are the risk factors that will cause us to use Provena or risk factors from using Provena. I, I have yet to find a risk from using Provena. The only problem that we have faced, and this is important in the beginning if you're starting to use this dressing. Uh, the dressing is sealed all the way around uh, with an adhesive tape, and sometimes this gets pulled off a little bit when the chest drains are being removed, When if you have pacing wires when they're being removed, and then the dressing loses the vacuum. And, and the nurses, if they're not taught and educated on how to reseal it, they just take it off after a day or two when they lost the vacuum. And, and that is annoying because, uh, you know, you lost the value of the dressing uh, if it's been removed too early. But that risk of losing the effect of the dressing too early because it's not managed appropriately uh, I, can be mitigated, obviously, by proper education of the nursing staff on how to manage the dressing, how does it work, and how to reseal it which is very easy. You just apply another uh, upside or a sticky dressing uh, around. Uh, it's difficult. Yeah, SSI is prevention is difficult as it's multifactorial, absolutely. Um, and you have to look at, if you are serious about reusing SSI in your department, and as I said, we looked at the patient selection, we looked at intraoperative factors, and we looked at post-op. And in post-op, this is the only thing that we wanted to look at was uh, the way we dressed the wound. And that's why we went down this route of looking at Provena in a bit more detail, and we came up with all the evidence that we came up with. But every step in the patient's journey from the clinic to admission before surgery, to surgery, to after surgery, all these steps, uh, will add to the risk of infection, and they all need to be addressed um, uh, at every stage. Uh, why do you give antibiotics after surgery? Well, in, in our um, uh, institution here, we give uh, prophylaxis antibiotics three doses, uh, one before, one immediately after, and one further dose uh, in the evening for cardiac surgery. And this has been uh, shown in a number of uh, audits that we have done within the department to be uh, the most effective way for us. Uh, uh, is it based on a randomized trial? No, but it is based on audit data that we have uh, completed here within our department. Uh, how often the infection developed uh, after the surgery for sternal uh, mean infection? 
for sternal wound infections, as I showed before in the multi-center study, it's about 15% of patients get sternal wound infection. So it's not small. Uh, luckily, only a, a fraction of that uh, develop deep sternal wound infection, which is, is the where the sternum breaks down and you have the heart exposed and you need to use then uh, a vac dressing, but that's a different uh, vac, dr vacuum dressing to try and recover, uh, clear the wound, clean it as much as possible before normally you need uh, plastic intervention to uh, close the wound eventually. Um, uh, does, so but, uh, yeah, uh, there are a few questions, a few more questions, but if you want me to stop, I'll stop. Yeah, no problem, uh, but uh, we, we can, uh, uh, if there is any communication channel, uh, so anyone from our uh, uh, our colleague, if uh, after the workshop, uh, if there is more question, uh, yes, we can continue. Yeah, the, this seems to be, yeah, absolutely. There seems to be a couple of questions about diabetes. I, I'm just going to answer them, if you, if I may, before I, I, I yeah. before I shut up. Uh, uh, diabetes is one of our risk factors, and about 30% of our patients in the UK are diabetics. I don't know how much in, in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, or around the world will be uh, diabetic patients. And we have observed that even with diabetes, the utilization of the Pravina dressing as the only intervention. I mean, we've done everything for everybody, but as an additional intervention, the Pravina dressing, uh, if a patient has diabetes and another risk factor, it does seem to reduce the risk of infection. Thank you very much again for the invitation and thank you for listening to me and for all your interaction and the questions. Uh, it's been great to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mahmoud, for your valuable information. Uh, and inshallah, we will uh, continue uh, communicating you if there is any uh, more question regarding uh, the information you provide uh, us today. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Mahmoud. Uh, now, inshallah, we will uh, give the mic to uh, Mr. Hatim, the regional clinical lead for Silphenum 3M. Uh, company to continue uh, the workshop regarding the SSI uh, prevention. Thank you so much. Okay, guys, uh, Salam Alaikum uh, once again. Can you hear me uh, well now? And you can see my screen as well? Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, Professor Lupani. Uh, already, Professor Lupani took us uh, through uh, a very informative information uh, how we can uh, deal with uh, uh, surgical site infection post operative. And in this section, we are going to uh, take the SSI from the beginning. We have a specific. Uh, uh, before we we move to the details of our uh, objective today, just two important points that we would like to highlight. First of all, uh, whatever materials, educational materials, uh, we will share with you today already <coughs> submitted and reviewed <coughs> and approved by uh, from the GDIBC team and Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia. Adding to that, uh, when we uh, reach the uh, surgical solution uh, or the product uh, 
section uh, just to let you know that all these solutions and the product already submitted and evaluated as well uh, from the GDIBC team and recommended that it would support you as a health care professionals and practitioners to reduce the risk of the surgical site infection. So in the coming slides, we will uh, cover some of the uh, uh, objectives. Uh, as you can see, we will talk about the surgical patient care pathway. What are the factors that might increase the SSI and how we can implement the best practice according to the global guidelines, adding to the local guidelines from Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia uh, to uh, reduce the risk of SSI. And we will have uh, more details or more focus on a specific uh, points according to um, uh, the survey or the analysis already conducted from uh, Minister of Health team and the uh, extracted some of the uh, gap analysis related to uh, some of these uh, tools looks like a surgical scrub, uh, how we can uh, uh, increase the comply uh, and compliance to the surgical scrub incision management uh, related to uh, hair removal, how we can prepare the patient skin before the surgery, uh, pre intra post. Uh, how we can uh, follow the guidelines and the best practice related to patient prepping uh, before the surgery. And for sure, we need to highlight uh, some highlight, uh, some, some uh, highlight about the importance of patient warming as well. And we will have uh, a quick slides, not much details about the incision management since most of uh, the information already covered by Professor Lubani. So it's not uh, change. Okay, so at the beginning, and as you know, surgical site infection is considered one of the most common uh, hospital acquired infection. And uh, by uh, CDC guidelines definition, it's uh, considered the infection that could happen at the incision site uh, during the surgery and up to 90 days, including the implant. Uh, we have different types. There are different types of from the surgical site infection, according to the symptoms that the patient is suffering from. It could be super in superficial uh, SSI or deep incisional SSI or organ space uh, SSI. Actually, SSI has main uh, two challenges. The first challenge related to SSI, the complications of surgical site infection. And here we can see some statistics from the US that they are talking about two to five percent of the total surgery patient gut infection during the surgery. And this leading to uh, increasing the risk of mortality rate and the morbidity rate for sure. Uh, patient gut infection during the surgery, we have to increasing the nursing care. Uh, some of the patients require admitted to the critical care units to start to treat the infection. And this leading to increased length of hospital stay uh, by 7 to 11 days, according to the statistics, statistics that we have. Uh, and we, we, we cannot ignore as well the uh, average cost of SSI from the US. It, 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 it costs approximately 20,000 US dollars for one patient. And um, from uh, experience in Saudi Arabia, the, the, the cost is going to be more higher than 20,000 uh, for one patient. So this is one of uh, of the challenges related to surgical site infection. Uh, but actually, uh, we, we we the good news that according to the clinical research and the guideline that 60 to 70 percent of the surgical site infection it could be prevented if we are comply with the global guidelines and best practice the second uh, challenge is coming from the ssi and here we can see this slide which is already created by cdc guidelines uh, the main objective from this equation created by cdc guidelines just to uh, identify uh, the most common uh, factors leading to increase in the ssi risk this is uh, the first objective, and here we can see a uh, dose of bacteria, virulence of bacteria, and the resistance of the host as well. The second objective from this equation, just to identify what are the factors that we can control and what are the factors that we cannot control. Whatever we cannot control, 
uh, whatever we can control, it means that we will succeed to reduce the risk of SSI. So from this equation, violence of bacteria, we can see that it's something out of our hand, it's something related to the microorganism itself we cannot control. Even the immunity system of the patients, if we are dealing with a patient, uh, obese patient, the diabetic patient, smoking patient, all these factors, actually, unfortunately, we cannot control. Uh, meanwhile, dose of bacteria is considered one of the factors or the main factors is that we can control where we can reduce the dose of bacteria or the count of microorganisms from the patient on the skin. So this will help us uh, to reduce the risk of SSI. And just to imagine the challenges coming from uh, the dose of bacteria, we can see on the right uh, side of the slides, uh, this small pictures actually clarify the uh, human microbiome. Uh, and as you know that our body already have, have, a lot, have a lot of the microorganisms distributed in different uh, locations and regions, starting from nose, mouth and gut and even the skin. So we are talking about uh, approximately 37 trillion human cell versus around 100 trillion bacterial or uh, micro uh, bacterial cells so actually we can say that we are living in a microorganism uh, world and uh, from this point the challenge are uh, not easy to, uh, to 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 reduce the risk of SSSI which means that we need to protect the patient from his own skin and those of bacteria for sure, it's it's not coming only from the patient on the skin. It's, it's it could be coming from the uh, OR environment and from the surgical stuff, and from the uh, patient on the skin. But according to the uh, clinical research and the study, they found out that uh, 60 around 60 or 70 percent of the microorganism leading to SSI coming from the patient uh, on the skin. Is there is some lag in the slide change. Okay, uh, so as as we said that SSI is something related to multi-factor so that we cannot uh, to, to, to reduce the risk of SSI, we have to think about uh, the whole factor that it might uh, increase the uh, risk of SSI. And here we can see uh, what is called the surgical patient care pathway. Surgical patient care pathway, it's something related to its uh, multidisciplinary plan consists of uh, multiple tools that we have to take care of every patient having a surgical procedure. Uh, starting from the patient education, for sure, one of the most important points that we have to keep in our consideration uh, before surgery and even after the surge from the uh, healthcare facility. Uh, adding to that, we have specific tools uh, supported and clarified by different guidelines, especially uh, clarified by WHO guidelines. There are specific tools or checklists that we have to implement with every patient as a surgical procedure, preoperative phase, intraoperative phase, and postoperative phase. So whenever we, 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 we have any high rate, for example, in SSI, we have to uh, uh, a full uh, look to the uh, all these tools or all these phases implemented with every patient. Uh, we will start by the perioperative measures, and by the way, all these measures identified and agreed from and provided to us uh, from uh, GDIBC team and Ministry of Health in Saudi. Uh, we have here some examples or measurements for the perioperative phase. It looks like risk assessment, perioperative shower or scrub, hair removal, uh, skin preparation before the surgery. 
uh, management of uh, surgical personnel, uh, the uh, peroperative surgical antimicrobial prophylactic and peroperative glycemic control. For sure, we will not uh, have enough time to cover all these uh, tools or, or these measures, but we will focus on, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my session, that we will focus only on the uh, the most common gap analysis uh, identified and extracted from the team in Ministry of Health of Saudi. And for sure, we cannot start uh, any uh, plan or any uh, 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 audit or any controlled plan before we, uh, without we mention the importance of hand hygiene. And uh, hand hygiene, as you know, is considered is supported by all the guidelines, and we agreed that. Uh, Hand hygiene is considered the most important process in preventing hospital acquired infection. And if there is any ineffective hand hygiene, it means that this will cause a complete infection prevention strategy to fail. And just to 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 share with you the uh, uh, from our daily experience in in, in our business uh, and the visiting different healthcare facilities that uh, we can see that still. Uh, although we have in, uh, already in 2024, still there is low risk, low compliance to the uh, hand hygiene. And actually this uh, back to different reasons. Some of them, uh, lack of sink, uh, quality of water. Uh, uh, there is no clear uh, guidelines or recommendation according to the contact time with the uh, surgical hand hygiene before the surgery. Adding to that, um, the main objective from the hand hygiene that we need to kill the microorganism without killing our skin. And this is actually one of the uh, important factors that we need to highlight. And this is we collected this data from the surgical stuff that they are suffering uh, because of prolonged and repeated exposure for uh, on a daily basis for peeling of water, scrubbing, brushing, all these things leading to skin damage. To their skin, uh, irritation, roughness, uh, uh, and sometimes some uh, sores on their hands. And uh, uh, here we can see one of the uh, ERN guidelines. Uh, they mentioned it clearly uh, the evidence indicates that surgical hand scrub should not be performed using a brush because scrubbing with a brush may damage the skin and increase bacterial shedding from the hand. So, this is something actually is. Uh, is not uh, uh, recommended or to, it is not preferred anymore because they a lot of the clinical research found out that the uh, negative impact of uh, of scrubbing and the brushing on the hand of the surgical uh, surgical team and just to be clear on this point again okay, it's coming and just to be clear here that we, we are going to share with you the best practice and the global guidelines related to what are the, the criteria should be uh, available in the surgical hand hygiene, specifically specifically for the uh, surgical procedure. Here we can see the guidelines recommend uh, you have uh, two options. Either you can go with the antimicrobial soup or water alcohol based hand drop. So these are the two a criteria or two recommended uh, solutions related to the surgical hand scrub without any brushing or scrubbing. Uh, if we need to go more uh, to have more focus and the deep diving for much details about uh, these guidelines, we can see uh, some of the guidelines looks like ORN, CDC, WHO, and they found out that uh, when we are using two active ingredients, alcohol with chloric zinc gluconate as a surgical hand hygiene is performing better against the count of microorganisms and provide you with not only with fast killing of microorganisms, adding to that, provide you with persistence effectiveness during the journey of the surgery. And uh, they found out that uh, if we have uh, such a solution with uh, concentration varies between 0.5 to 1% of CHG, it means that it was, the result will be greater in the residual activity uh, than alcohol alone. 
And one of the most important point actually that I would love to to highlight according to the contact time, because what we what we noticed that uh, some of the uh, healthcare facilities and the infection control, for example, uh, recommendation they said that you can uh, we started before by five to six minutes, and when the, we found out that there is a low compliance to the hand hygiene, uh, some of these policy and the guidelines already changed and uh, became. In a state of five to six minutes, you have you can go do scrubbing for three minutes, and I can see I can say to you that some healthcare facilities uh, follow at least two minutes as a scrubbing, and here we can see that this va variation in the in the contact time with the surgical hand hygiene, which is, is considered the most important process in preventing hospital acquired infection. And just to be clear with you guys, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to differentiate between uh, the internal policy and we need to uh, between the internal policy and the manufacturing instruction. Why I'm, I'm saying that because whenever and or you go you can check it by yourself if you have a look to whatever solution you have in your facility just uh, have a look to the uh, uh, application technique or how our manufacturing instruction you will see that they mentioned clearly that whenever you are going to use the antimicrobial soap you need to do scrubbing at least for two minutes for the, for example, for the first arm, for example, and then for two minutes for the second arm. And even the mention in the in instruction for use, after you are following this uh, steps, you need to re uh, rinse your hand uh, below your running water, and then you have to repeat the same process for another two minutes. We so it, it means that we are talking about average from five to six minutes according to the manufacturing instruction. So we have to follow the manufacturing instruction if we need to get the best outcomes and the better benefits and the desired impact from this antimicrobial soup. So this is a very important. Yes, we have internal policy, for example, talking about two minutes or three minutes, but we have to uh, follow as well the manufacturing instruction according to uh, for the uh, whatever the antimicrobial soap available in your health care facilities. So this actually clarify to us or put uh, give us attention uh, why we still uh, have low compliance to the surgical hand hygiene, which is considered very important and very uh, crucial to reducing the surgical site infection. Adding to that, and as you know that even during the surgery, especially if you are talking about high risk of gloves puncture and the damage, it's, it's a very high. Uh, so once this puncture or damage happened, it means that now our hands are, uh, are exposed to the, to the incision site, which means that we put our patient at high risk for the surgical site infection. So it's very important to uh, have a fast killing that you have antimicrobial soup or surgical hand hygiene provide you with fast killing of microorganisms. On the same time, provide you with persistence effectiveness against the microorganism during the journey of surgery. So starting by uh, the points related to patient preparation, and here we can see that the guidelines support and strongly recommend the perioperative showering. And according to this uh, guideline, uh, guidelines, we can consolidate it that every patient is planning to have a surgical procedure. He should receive uh, two shower, one at night before the surgery, and the second one on the same day of surgery before the uh, surgery time. And even we can see that uh, the recommendation from uh, Saudi Ministry of Health in Saudi GDIBC team that uh, they uh, recommend to have uh, a chlorhexine gluconate four percent uh, as uh, antimicrobial soup as a showering at night and on the same day before surgery. And some some guidelines they are talking about two percent of chlorhexine gluconate it will be enough. But if we uh, on the same time if we uh, for example WHO mentioned that in case your facility does not have this uh, such type of uh, chlorhexine gluconate uh, soup antimicrobial soup at least as a patient he can uh, utilize any other uh, plain soup before the surgery because the, all the guidelines and the clinical researches he found out that it's 
participate in significant reduction in uh, the count of the microorganism from the patient on the skin. And please keep in your mind whatever we mentioned before that around 60 or 70 percent of the microorganism leading to SSI coming from the patient on the skin. So it's very important to uh, comply with the guidelines where we uh, need to uh, reduce the count of microorganisms from the patient on the skin as maximum as we can before the surgery. Uh, the, so after we do showering, we need to, uh, to to start dealing with the hair removal. And uh, uh, in this slide, I'm trying to gathering all the most important uh, parts or recommendation related to hair removal, and uh, I can uh, uh, consolidate it in four main points. Uh, the first of all, that hair removal it is not mandatory by guidelines, but on the same time, we have to keep in our mind that if hair at or around the incision site interfere with the surgery, it should be removed by clipping, no more razors, for sure, we, it's something, uh, we called it a solvent issue. All guidelines agreed that clipper is uh, strongly recommend whenever we need to remove the hair, no more razors, since razor already participate in increasing the SSI rate threefold uh, comparing with the uh, clipping. So first of all, hair removal, it is not mandatory unless the hair at or around the incision site interfere with the surgery. If hair removal is required, it should be conducted by clipping outside operating room and before the surgery. So we have to comply with that uh, OR outside OR because inside the operating room, it, it means that it will lead, take us to a very big mess inside the operating room. Uh, the only uh, exception for conducting hair removal inside operating room uh, in emergency cases or in uh, neurosurgery, for example. So these are considered the most important for a recommendation uh, related to the hair removal. Uh, glucose control is, is considered one of the uh, most uh, important as well uh, from the checklist uh, and the uh, preoperative measurements. And um, you can see the, uh, the statement uh, highlighted by blue color. This is, uh, we take it copy paste from the recommendation of uh, Ministry of Health in Saudi, implement preoperative glycemic control and use blood glucose target level less than 150 milligram per deciliter before, during, and after the procedure for the first two post-operative days in patients with and without diabetes. And for sure, we know that uh, hyperglycemia in the preoperative period increase the risk of uh, infection and other adverse clinical outcomes, including renal and graft rejection as well. According to antibiotic prophylactic, uh, uh, Minister of Health actually create a very nice link, uh, take you through all a list of uh, antibiotic uh, duration, how, uh, what is the frequent time before surgery, uh, at least from 30 to, 60, to 30 to 60 minutes before the surgery, and we need to uh, stop it, stop the, uh, the antibiotic after surgery from 24 to 48 hours according to the type of surgery. So this is something we will not have much details because it is already clarified uh, in a very nice way uh, from Minister of Health's uh, team. They have linked this, uh, uh, the link that take us to this uh, very long list of the antibiotic. Uh, what, what we need just to comply with the time of uh, antibiotic uh, infusion and for sure the time of cut of the antibiotic because we don't need to have a false judgment about this infection, it is happening or not, we don't need to continue uh, giving antibiotic after surgery uh, for a long period of time so that we can identify if the patient got infection during the surgery or not. We need to choose the uh, appropriate time and the dosage and agent as well. Uh, now we will talk about the patient skin antiseptic actually and uh, if you remember the slide we where we talk about the human microbiome and the distribution and the huge account of microorganisms distributed in the patient skin, we start by uh, hair removal and for sure the uh, showering by antimicrobial soap. Now we need to uh, identify or talk more about how we can uh, reduce 
more account more, more count from microorganisms for patient on a skin and how we can uh, choose uh, most appropriate skin antiseptic agents and here we can see the uh, global guidelines related to uh, different uh, they are strongly recommended that uh, two active ingredients for sure it will be performed better again this is a count of microorganism uh, microorganism from one active ingredient here we can see w2 cdc shea and urn all of them strongly recommend two active ingredients and the rationale behind that that we found out that alcohol provides a patient with fast killing of microorganism we are do bactericidal on on a spot once we apply the alcohol but we cannot rely only on alcohol because as you know alcohol uh, persistence does not provide the patient with any persistence effectiveness the impact of alcohol it could be longer lasting by 10 to 15 or to 20 percent 20 uh, sorry 20 minutes according to the concentration and the type of the alcohol so by adding another our second active ingredient looks like chloric gluconate or iodine it means that i'm going to provide the patient with persistence activity during the surgery and here we can understand that there is no one prepping agent prefer another one at the end of the day as a healthy care practice uh, facility you need to have post uh, portfolio. You need to have the alcohol with iodine and the alcohol with chloric zinc gluconate, and then you start to decide uh, according to different factors. For example, if my patient has already sensitivity to iodine, um, I have to go with uh, alcohol with CHG, and vice versa. If the patient has a sensitivity to CHG, I have to use alcohol with iodine and so on so at the at the end of this point it's uh, because it's a little bit confused we need to understand that you need to have post portfolio in your health care facility alcohol with iodine and alcohol with chloric chloric gluconate as we highlight uh, the importance of hand hygiene and the contact time for sure, for the skin prepping agent, we have the same. There are a lot of factors impact the effectiveness of uh, skin antiseptic agent. Uh, looks like the concentration, the formulations, application technique, the drying time, the treatment, how much area I would like to uh, to cover before the surgery. Uh, uh, does this applicator or the solution I'm using will be enough? To, uh, to the areas that I would like to, to cover or not, and the drying time. And I would love actually to highlight more about the drying time because this is one of the repeated feedback we have noticed from different activity and the visits to different healthcare facilities in Saudi. And we found out that the most common practice that once we apply inside the operating room once the surgical team applies antiseptic agent they don't give it enough time to completely dry once they apply it immediately either they, they start to dry it by a uh, strial towel or they start to remove it or immediately they start to apply the drape over the patient skin and here we need to uh, for highlight and uh, drag your attention to the negative impact and the complications that could happen to the patient because of this practice and uh, just one one of these points that if we are utilizing two active ingredients including alcohol and as you know alcohol is a flammable so inside the operating room if there is any uh, ignition source or cutlery it means that we are putting uh, there are high high risk for the uh, firing could happen inside the operating room because alcohol is flammable so we have to give enough time to the antiseptic agent to till it's completely dry in a natural air and by the way it takes it from two to three minutes maximum and i'm here i'm for sure targeting i'm talking about the elective surgeries for the selective surgeries we are talking about different scenario we need to start the surgery we need to start saving the patient life but in case of the elective surgery we need to uh, apply the best practice as maximum as we can according to the guidelines global guidelines and according to the manufacturing instruction of different solution as well so two to three minutes according to the type of the applicators that you are using it will be fair enough to till it's completely dry and to give enough time to the alcohol to be completely evaporate the second point related to the importance of the drying time for the chloric zinc gluconate or bovidine iodine 
both of them as a molecule does not provide the patient with any fast acting. They are mainly relying on provide the patient with persistence activity. So iodine, bovidine iodine or CTG required some time to start its effectiveness. It could be two minutes, four minutes, five minutes, I don't know. But it requires some time to start its effectiveness against it as a microorganism as a bacteri bacteriostatic or bactericidal, bactericidal effect. So if we apply the antiseptic agent and immediately start the incision or start apply the drip, it means that my patient does not get the benefit from the skin antiseptic agent, which is considered one of the most important criteria before in preparing the patient before the incision. And keep in your mind that we need to reduce the count of the microorganism as maximum as we can before the surgery. One important point related to the drying time as well, and sometimes as, as, a, as a solventum company, X3M Healthcare, we receive some uh, concern or feedback from our customers. They are talking about when we start using Europrep, for example, from solventum company or Soluprep, we notice that the skin of the patient is a little bit irritated or there is uh, uh, sensitivity happen to the patient's skin. Actually, we, we cannot judge 100% that the reason is coming from the antiseptic agent itself, because this takes us to what is called a chemical trap. What does it mean of chemical trap? Chemical trap, it means that the antiseptic agent does not have any relation with sensitivity happening to the patient, but because we cover the patient's skin immediately by the draping, it doesn't give enough time to the antiseptic agent to be completely dry, so this will put the patient, especially if we are dealing with uh, old age patient or the patient who has uh, skin damage or skin fragile, fragile skin. So this will putting the patient at high risk for increasing the uh, chance for uh, irritation and sensitivity to the antiseptic agent. So please, it's very important, and I believe that. Once we do application for the antiseptic agent, whatever the applicator that you are used, still you need to open the drape, still you need to start fixing the drape, even the area that you are going to have the incision, it will be exposed for the surgery. So I, I believe that for the elective surgery, we might have this uh, enough time uh, till it's completely dry because it's a very important and very valid points in reducing the count of the microorganism. Uh, reducing the risk of firing because of the alcohol and uh, give enough time to the antiseptic agent, either bovodine, iodine, or chloric zinc gluconate to start its effectiveness. I totally noticed that I take a little bit much time focus on this point because uh, this is one of the most frequent gap uh, point that we notice from different health care facilities that we, uh, as a surgical team, we don't give enough time to the antiseptic agent till it's a completely dry. After we do showering, hair removal, skin antiseptic agent, which targeting mainly the skin surface microorganism or transient microorganism, still we have another challenge coming from the resident microorganism. As you know that we have two different from the microorganism, we have the transient microorganism, which most of them available in the skin surface of the patient. And we have the resident microorganism, which is available in the deep layer of the skin and around the hair follicles. Antiseptic agent or the applicator mainly targeting the transient microorganism at the skin surface. After some time from the incision, this resident microorganism in the deep layer of the skin and around the hair follicles start to migrate and come contact with the patient incision site, putting the patient at high risk to increase the risk of the SSI, especially for the high risk surgery, which takes too much time. We are talking about C-section, uh, neurosurgery, uh, for sure cardiac surgery and orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, all these uh, classified as a high risk surgery, long lasting surgeries, and adding to that, if we are dealing with a patient who already have 
uh, one or more from the risk factors it looks like obese or smoking or diabetic patient it means that the, the risk will be higher to uh, increase the risk of SSI so now we we need to start thinking how we can protect our patient not only from the transient microorganism adding to that adding to that from the resident microorganism so we we cover the point of the transient microorganism where we talk about the importance of uh, antiseptic agents alcohol with iodine or alcohol with chlorhexine gluconate so now to protect or to provide more protection to our patient against the resident microorganism we need to start thinking about how we can create a stride surface at the incision site before surgery and from this uh, picture you can see the uh, different uh, the area of strial fields which is highlighted by uh, blue arrows so this is indicated to the strial fields so the idea now that we need to start create a strial field at the incision site before the surgery how we can do that before we move to the uh, the details, just we need to highlight or to share with you these different guidelines from Asian guidelines, UK NICE guidelines and German guidelines and ORN as well and the Krenko, which is the Germany guidelines. They found out that in case you decide to use incised drape with your patient during the surgery, it is recommended to, to utilize incised drape impregnated with iodophore and here we can see consider using an iodophore impregnated incised drape nice guidelines the same use an iodophore impregnated drape ARN incised drape without antimicrobial properties should not be used which means that the clinical research and the guidelines they found out that clear incised drape does not participate in reducing the risk of SSI meanwhile if your incised drape impregnated with antimicrobial agent looks like iodophore, as mentioned here and recommended by different guidelines, they found out that it participate in a signific significant reduction in the risk of the surgical site infection. And just to, to highlight, based on what all these guidelines support, uh, the antimicrobial agents, we have uh, two clinical studies supported or conducted by Professor Elliott. One of them is started by chlorhexine gluconate. And the objective from this clinical study just to understand uh, to how much deep in the deep layer of the skin the antiseptic agent could be reached. So when it is implemented in the antiseptic agent and the chlorhexine gluconate, they found out that it could be reached up to 300 micron in the deep layer of the skin. The same study conducted on iodophore, and they found out that iodophore could be reached up to 1,000 micron in the deep layer of the skin, which means that iodophore can reach more deep and it can reach to, to the resident microorganism in the deep layer of the skin and around here follicles. استاذ حاتم معليش بس الصوت قطع عندنا
ما ادري استرحات معنا الصوت قطع طيب معلش عشان في خلل تقني عند الاستاذ حاتم آه بس دقايق وحيرجع ان شاء الله
معليش جين عشان بس خلى التقني عند الاستاذ حاتم الان بي بيحاول يدخل مره اخرى وبيعرض السلايد 